All right, well, welcome everyone to this uh, third lecture this spring in our lecture series. I'm very honored to introduce Caitlin Cherry, who was born in Chicago in 1987. She draws on painting, sculpture, and installation in her multifaceted practice, coalescing in articulate and alluring representations of black femininity. Filtering these media through layers of digital manipulation, her work draws parallels between black femme bodies frequently com commodified and positioned as sexual assets and the seductiveness of art objects in the commercial gallery circuit. Cherry is currently assistant professor of painting and printmaking at Vir Virginia Commonwealth University and the founder of the new online program, Dark Study, a contra-institutional space for racial, excuse me, I can't read, for radical learning about art and theory. Her paintings have been exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum, Performance Space, and the Studio Museum in Harlem, among other institutions of note. She is a recipient of a Rauschenberg Foundation Fellowship Residency and Lenore Annenberg Fellowship. And, and, you know, we're so honored to have you here, Caitlin, and I look forward to hearing about your work. And I know there are going to be a lot of questions at the end. So with that, I'm going to sign off. And um, here we go. Thank you so much, Dana, for that introduction. And it's really nice to be here um, in whatever here means. You know, I, I see the the number of participants, but don't see you all, unfortunately. So it's nice to, um, always nice to take an opportunity to talk about my work, which I feel like at this point changes monthly and evolves monthly. So um, even in what I was making, you know, this month versus what I was making in November, um, feels like it's, it's fundamentally a little bit different. So I'm gonna try to, um, let me get into the slides and then I can um, begin. Okay, I'm going to assume that that is, can be seen. Um, so yeah, so I mean, um, I'm going to kind of frame this talk, particularly around the work that I've been making in the past few years. Um, and give you an overview of how I feel like this particular body of work um, originated. And so I'm gonna jump kind of, I'm gonna jump in and, you know, in and out of uh, different exhibitions and, um, you know, it'll, it'll get linear at points, but I wanted to start from the end, um, which is my most recent painting that I have not yet finished that's in my studio right now. And, um, so as Dana kind of mentioned, I'm, I'm a painter, but I have always been interested in a sort of intersection between um, painting, sculpture, and installation specifically, and thinking about, you know, not just um, the sort of information that goes on the surface of paintings in terms of like um, the sort of narratives and and images I'm trying to generate, but also that um, I'm interested in how paintings circulate as objects within um, systems of galleries and museums um, before this body of work kind of started. And I'm talking about a body of work of the past few years. Um, I have also been making other painting, I call them painting installations, painting installations that were, um, you know, involving a sort of critique of the institutions in which they end up being exhibited in. So um, my newest, this body of work in which I'll introduce is kind of coming from um, a point when I felt I needed to have a kind of um, reset, hit a reset button, which, which, which happens. I've been uh, working uh, professionally as an artist for a decade now. And so there, there's these waves and um, all these different strategies that I feel artists need to um, use in order to survive and also just to think about how they want their art to, to fuel them as people. And so sometimes these points of reset need to happen. So starting from the, um, the end, um, which is my most recent painting, um, I show this because I just wanted to show a couple of studio shots, um, which I usually never do in a lecture, but, um, you know, just to show a little bit of my my process, which is kind of messy. Um, I don't consider myself a messy person, but um, you know, I tend to paint very large 
works on stretched on the wall in the studio and um you know i i i go through like a roll of paper towels a day and i have like very little studio infrastructure um i don't have like the fancy tables and the the fancy um you know sort of uh almost like professionalized setup just because i i really do invest all of my energy into the process of painting and um I've also been pretty transient for the last five years. So I, I don't, <laughs> I don't honestly invest much energy into like uh, building up a, a fancy studio. Oops. Actually, hold on just one minute. Make sure I can go to the next slide. There we go. So another studio shot. So you can kind of see like, um, you know, I, I'm working from a laptop and I got my disposable palettes. So um, this is from um, a show that I did called Noisy Boy at uh, Luce Gallery in Turin, Italy. And um, this was um, in the fall of 2019. And this exhibition, um, I, I'll use it to kind of talk about what I feel is my, my, my prime interest at the moment, which is um, thinking about um, light which seems like a kind of basic concept, but you know, I'll sort of explain what I mean um, in some moments that I feel like a kind of anecdotal. Um, I oftentimes, even though my work can feel very, you know, heavily saturated and kind of like, um, you know, almost coming from this this otherworldly perspective, the the things that I feel I'm interested in, like light, happen to also equally be very natural phenomenon, things that happen between my vision and, and sometimes the sun, um, and just noticing little, little sort of peculiarities in um, both my vision as it, it distorts and sometimes doesn't work properly, but also, um, you know, thinking about, for example, um, I always tell the story about how, um, I'm currently in a very sunny room and um, that moment when you might be sitting in a place where the sun covers one part of your eye and the other part is in shadow and it, it causes a distortion of the way that you see um, because both eyes usually communicate with each other to um, give you a, a singular image. But when you have one eye in extreme um, sun and one eye in a sort of shadow, your image, your, your vision flickers and um, it's trying to reconcile two realities at the same time. And therefore sometimes there's these phenomena that happen. Um, for example, um, you might start seeing white, things that are white um, start flickering blue um, and a sort of um, that flickering is something that I try to capture in a static image in paint. So, um, and these are all just the individual images of these paintings. I'll tell more technical details, but for the most part, these are very large oil paintings and they're you know, about 70 by 70 inches. Um, so I'm thinking about another natural phenomenon that I, I, I am influenced by is um, you know, thinking about the reflection of, um, as also a phenomenon of the sun reflecting in something where um, if you were to have a glass of water in um, extreme sun and how you'll start to notice as the water ripples that um, there'll be this sort of rainbow. So like the water is causing the, the light of the sun to separate and um, you sometimes note this sort of, you know, you'll see these like phthalo greens and blues and oranges and yellows, almost like a kind of partial rainbow. Um, caused by that, that, that rippling in the water. Um, and that was something that I, I have sort of noted as being um, also another phenomenon that I, I try to capture in my painting. Um, so this body of work from Noisy Boy um, very specifically had the idea of like, um, you know, thinking about black femininity in relationship to um, machines and specifically uh, like automobiles and motorcycles and things like that as a way to um, discuss specifically like how um, 
um, how black femininity is a kind of um, a slippery uh, framework and that I pull from images um, from a lot of different sources, which I'll talk about more, but um, I sometimes pull from images from like um, black female and femme rappers and models and Instagram models and exotic dancers, blah, blah, blah. And um, therefore I am kind of trying to locate very specific um, trends in culture, which is essentially that in music videos, you see a lot of the time women posing with these fancy cars. And as they pose themselves with the cars, they accidentally kind of have these moments of like merging with the machine in a sort of cyborg way. Um, and therefore they kind of complete each other and make each other um, more powerful um, or more sort of powerful and functional as they, they communicate with each other. And this is just an, an image from like an interior shot um, within a vehicle, but just some friends that are hanging out. So sorry, I'm just, I'm cycling through these a little quicker just to um, get back to the beginning. So um, I wanted to talk about how this, this current, this body of work began. Um, and I would say it probably began around uh, spring 2000. Hmm, I think it was about 2018, but um, I'm getting to the point where it's like, oh, you know, that was almost like four years ago. Um, and I was a visiting professor at University of uh, Tennessee, Knoxville for a semester and really at this sort of um, point in my career where I was kind of needing to like back build, you know, like I think I had some years of downtime and I began teaching more formally um, and to a greater capacity. And as somebody who's coming from a, a sort of interest with an interest of institutional critique in my former work, um, not to disconnect that work from this work, but just to say that, um, you know, I spent um, a lot of time, money and energy building these big, you know, painting installations as I call them where paintings are, you know, you might see if you Googled me like, the Brooklyn Museum show called Hero Safe where I positioned paintings mounted on Leonardo da Vinci style catapults and also did an installation where um, there was like a cannon uh, for my, my Columbia thesis exhibition that's like shooting at another painting across the, the room. And then um, just thinking about both um, the sort of potential for um, paintings to um, be used or seen differently if you reposition them as objects and also think about where they're being displayed, um, you know, in the instance of like the Brooklyn Museum, which was, uh, and I just don't have the images here just because I don't want this to become too much of a tangent, but I, I'm getting into it a little bit more than I, I usually do. Just to say that, um, you know, when a painting is in a museum, it becomes like a cultural symbol. And um, so I'm not only interested in making paintings because I love to be making paintings, but also that, um, I love thinking about how they operate as a kind of uh, pinnacle of, you know, an artistic medium that's very revered and valued um, and circulates in those ways. So um, I say that to say there was a lot of stress and anxiety that ended up developing when I was doing these big productions, um, essentially that it became a lot for me to try to have my artwork do a lot. Um, all the time and um, my projects got bigger and bigger. Um, so I, in, in the spring 2018, when I started teaching, I actually realized that teaching becomes my release valve um, for allowing me to make a different sort of work for a moment. And that work ends up being a little, um, especially at this point, you know, really just like almost uh, a kind of fan art. Um, that by, by art world standards or art education standards is um, sometimes frowned upon. 
And I was, um, this was coming off of the, the winter where um, there was the debut of the, the motorsport music video by Cardi, um, Cardi B and uh, Nicki Minaj with uh, Migos. And I was really um, just thinking about how much I loved that music video as kind of being like a, a symbol of a return of big budget um, video production and um, in American music specifically and centering on hip hop and rap, but just generally that we're talking about a return to big budget um, music videos after a long hiatus. Um, so I, I make these portraits of them and um, specifically um, that this point of thinking about fan art, which is often frowned upon. Um, another moment I, I remember, um, which happened more more recently, I was uh, I was asked to um, you know participate in VCU. I, I teach at Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, VCU Arts. We had um, we have our portfolio day where we invite our undergrads to come, uh, our potential, our future prospective undergrads to come and show their portfolios. And I remember one of the administrators who was trying to manage all the the faculty who are participating in portfolio day. I remember this one administrator specifically telling me to watch out for fan art as being something that um, might mean that a student is not ready conceptually to enter undergrad, which I just sort of laugh at because clearly <laughs> this administrator did not know my work at all. But um, you know, just thinking about a kind of like a, a raw interest in art, which a lot of us um, we're making um, at some point, maybe in high school or middle school, like the, the, the drawings we were ma making sometimes, you know, might be fan art. So um, I take that actively as like a, an entry point into a new body of work because um, I'm trying to rescue, <laughs> I'm trying to rescue it from being this sort of like um, this lesser mode of making within the realm of fine art. What does it mean to be like indulgent as an artist? Um, and what does it mean to kind of be free from this, this sort of need for critique constantly um, when you end up feeling kind of um, in this permanent place of cynicism and I wanted to have a moment of joy. So I decided to make these paintings. And this one is of uh, uh, Black China who's a, uh, an influencer and dancer. Um, and um, this is also very early on, I start to distort the, the skin tones of images that I'm pulling from, um, you know, uh, pulling them into photo editing programs and distorting the color by um, solarizing the image. And um, the solarization um, is also one of those things that, um, is, is thought of as a sort of technical phenomena, um, almost you might know of it as a, a photo filter that might be a little outdated, um, especially in like the early 2000s when we, we used to, you know, um, think about converting an image in a sort of filter way, like the filters were really blunt and really like, uh, um, you know, it's like we had like the emboss filter and stuff like that. So solarization is something that's kind of fallen out of favor as a photo, photo filter, but still exists in all of these programs. And um, I was trying to think of how um, solarization could become something to represent a lot of different things that I'm thinking of, but also that solarization is one of these natural phenomena that happen. Um, so, um, well, I'll say, um, Another source of solarization is when you um, accidentally overexpose film. So in photography, um, if film is overexposed, the image starts to invert. So um, in that process between its real color and its inversion, there's a midway point. And that, that midway point is solarization. So brown skin turns um, slightly blue, especially um, the moments that are the extreme highlight like hopefully you can see my cursor, um, this point on her shoulder and her hand and the nose um, ends up kind of becoming the darkest moments in the skin tone. So it's like a, a sort of in-between uh, version, but um, 
solarization was also my way of kind of trying to, to represent something like iridescence, um, which I think is just a, a visual, you know, phenomenon that I'm, I think is incredibly beautiful. It's like a rainbow and, you know, um, when we think of indulgence in, in, in painting, like it's just something that really speaks to me. But um, iridescence is something that's kind of been um, something that sits between a sort of technical phenomenon and natural phenomenon. You know, there's, there's animals um, that use iridescence. And um, the thing about something like iridescence is that it um, can only be experienced um, in movement. So you can't really understand something to be iridescent unless you change your relationship to the iridescent thing. And that becomes much greater of an interest for me, not just thinking about how my paintings look and the color systems that they use, but also this patterning behind them, which is also kind of another attempt at iridescence in a certain way, and specifically how the computer tries to replicate and process iridescence um, in like photo editing programs and things like that. Um, but that um, iridescence is uh, also kind of like now risen to be a sort of symbol of a thing that's like um, technological and thinking about the, the, the screen, um, which is something I'll talk about even more in depth um, in relationship to the work and how I mine images, um, which is usually through social media, uh, like Instagram and uh, mining on Google image search. So, um, you know, um, painters um, for a long time have been trying to grapple with this sort of era, a new era in mining source images when we are now doing that on the internet. And that's like a kind of boring conversation because it's like a given, but um, I, I think, for me, it's important to not just try to, you know, represent the the black femmes and the black women that I'm um, I'm I'm trying to find and the worlds that they come from, which are the worlds of kind of like a list celebrity, like the Cardis and Nickies, but also like um, sometimes um, you know bartenders and um, exotic dancers and um, lesser known folks, B list and C list rappers. Um, and stuff like that, where um, I'm not just trying to find them and replicate them, but also simultaneously represent how I see them, which is usually through, um, you know, through the phone and through the and through the the laptop screen. Um, and that is a uh, a point of tension for me because it is something that we do see. Um, but as an interface, it's something we also pretend like we don't see, and it's some a world that we enter. Um, so another primary interest of mine is repositioning the role of the painting as a window, which is kind of historically um, historically understood, you know, because of a painting and its shape. Um, and, you know, it's a shape that we're accustomed to looking out of in a, an interior space that um, to move it into thinking about how screens are also um, ubiquitous in our lives and another world that we enter into that um, how can I try to represent that space between like my eyesight and the image that I'm, I'm looking at. So that becomes also a substance worth investigating. And I, I use a lot of different strategies to do that. One being the sort of that pattern that you'll see a lot of um, just to go back this pattern, which I call the Aurora um, which ends up kind of engulfing a lot of the figures and spilling out of them and making them almost camouflage at times, but also this um, light and dark bands that you'll start to see. And you see them, especially in the works that I began the, the talk with, but, um, you know, the introduction of these, um, what I would call like a moiré pattern, um, which is a phenomenon of the screen, especially if you've ever taken a digital camera photo of your your LCD laptop screen. Um, so with that said, um, this is an installation work of some of these smaller portraits that I think was fall 2018. So that's about the time that we're at. Uh, 
Um, so this is like the only painting that I've ever done that was actually an attempt at painting, um, painting an inversion. And um, it's interesting uh, because, sorry, I can't see my own painting. Um, it's interesting because um, and I, I decided not to do this during the lecture just because of, I can already tell that I'm blabbing and it's gonna take some time, but um, you know, when you invert, reinvert this image, you, you realize that she's actually like a brown skinned woman wearing a purple dress. Um, and that's, that was something that was um, a challenge to represent because if you don't quite get the colors accurately and you, in, if, and you reinvert this image that um, you actually don't get it right, it won't turn brown. It'll make her still be sort of alien so um, that's to say that, um, not that I demand anybody in the gallery to imagine this painting inverted, reinverted back to its original color system, because that's not the, you know, that's not the, the reason that the painting is inverted, but um, really it's just sort of um, thinking about how to kind of like um, hide was it hide in plain sight, which is, you know, a, a, uh, an interest of being camouflaged, but also specifically what I think about um, black women, black femmes have to do in order to sort of navigate the world. Um, the women that I represent um, also tend to be, especially in the worlds that I'm pulling from, um, worlds of popular culture, that they're, they're, they already have a certain profile um, that they're building or have built, and therefore they have a certain um, visibility within the culture. And um, I'm interested in how, specifically, if you're talking about, you know, um, you know, rappers and things like that that are popular today, who kind of have this very particular aesthetic um, and body type and things like that. Like these used to be, you know, called you know, ghetto and this and that in the 90s before, you know, back when it was like sort of the day of Lil' Kim and, um, you know, her kind of like hardcore style, um, you know, wearing like multicolored wigs in the same video and things like that. But nowadays it's actually become the mainstream culture and you'll see a little bit, you know, I'm sitting here with my blue hair. So it's so funny that I can't see anybody because I can't see anybody react to anything. But um, that essentially now it's become popular that I can be sitting here like as a professor with the blue hair. And, um, you know, it's kind of like um, everybody, a little bit of everybody has kind of like uh, the Kardashians and things like that have kind of like um, made these like standards of beauty that have been taken from a sort of underground, you know, world specifically that used to be like frowned upon. So there, are, um, th that's to say there are women who are hyper visible in the culture and also like underrepresented and um, despite their visibility and their fame, that doesn't necessarily mean much for the general, uh, for general black femininity. So um, this is also another reason for this black and this black, this, um, this dark and light color set this dark and light separation when I try to do this more a patterning within a painting. And this is actually an image of Lil' Kim um, from back in the day that's kind of been stretched out. Um, one thing I will say about the more pattern system is that I like saying it's, I, it's I'm saying system a lot, but one thing about the more patterning is that um, then I get into this point, you know, I just, I, I talked about the LCD screen and the LCD screen is very, I mean, it's so ubiquitous in our minds. I'm looking at an LCD screen right now because I have a MacBook Air, like the current one. We've been looking at LCD screens um, for some years now. That's what most of our current screens are made out of. But it, we're interestingly about to enter um, a new era of a different type of screen, which is now being like rolled out called like the, the OLED screens. The LCD screen, um, is a liquid crystal display and has a certain hybridity um, built into it that these crystals are almost in between two different states of matter. They're in between being liquid and they're in between being a solid and they sit in this crystal state. Um, and because of how they operate, you have these phenomena like the more uh, pattern that pops up when you, you know, you take a photo of the, the screen at a inoptimal angle, or if you, 
um, this goes back to, to solarization as well. Um, if imagine yourself laying down in relationship to your laptop and you tilt the screen up too high or too low, and you're looking at an image or a movie, you're watching a movie, um, the the colors start in, starts to invert. So actually, the liquid the the liquid crystal display screen demands you sit optimally in relationship to it, or else it starts to not malfunction, but that it starts to distort. So um, again, just reiterating, um, well, introducing that, but also reiterating the point about how iridescence is also about positioning in relationship to a thing because these things um, become even more important moving on. And that's to say um, the point of confusion between a camera and your screen, um, it's very interesting sometimes to, to see a phenomenon happen where your digital camera taking a photo of my painting gets confused if it were to focus in on a dark band versus a light band, which is painted purposefully, like very washed out, um, like this image here where the painting looks incredibly dark versus this image where the camera focused in on a light band and therefore blown out the rest of the image. So how do I make a painting that confuses a digital camera? I'm still trying to figure it out, but I think there's a, <laughs> I think there's a, a chance for me to figure it out. Um, so, oh Lord, I'm blabbing, but, um, you know, um, getting into sort of late 2018 and I, you know, um, I am still working on sort of how to, how to think about um, my relationship as a black woman and um, how do I, how, how I inhabit space and how sometimes I feel alien, but also just thinking about these sort of relationships um, that we have as humans versus other things like our relationships to machines, like I mentioned with the, the, the cars and the, the bikes, with the, the noisy boy show, which is like, a, you know, um, essentially me trying to hash that out within the imagery, literally painting black women and black femmes with their vehicles and with their G-Wagons and with their Corvettes and their, you know, Porsches, but um, also just thinking about a sort of a relationship between like human animal uh, thing. So I'm very interested in like Donna Haraway, the Cyborg Manifesto. I've written about my work's relationship to it and the hybrid, you know, thinking about the, the hybrid human machine. Um, that's something I won't, you know, read off of, but happy to drop a link uh, to y'all later on. Um, and, you know, just thinking about a certain con a computer vision um, that I'm trying to represent through solarization, blah, blah, blah. So um, this is now me starting to get back into installation. And these are two small paintings that are actually of the same, the same woman who works um, at a cabaret. And uh, they, um, you see in one image of her from the front and one image of her from the back. And um, I do this installation at a gallery called American Medium in New York, where I, um, since I'm so interested in thinking about my work's relationship to the LCD screen in picture, in the pictorial space of the painting, what were to happen if I were to return the painting to a LCD mount? You know, paintings are roughly also the same sort of size and width as LCD screens. So I think about an actual literal returning of the, the painting to a mount to almost, you know, in, reinforce that relationship. Um, but again, also thinking about moving through space, you are looking at the same woman, but for example, if you were to walk down this corridor, you first see, sorry, there's a garbage truck outside, it's making some noise. Um, you see the front of her and then you walk past and you see the, the back of her. So it's almost just kind of setting up a physical um, understanding of a one singular body within space. Um, and that, um, you're trying to understand this one person, but you're understanding it um, potentially mis, you know, incorrectly 
uh, which is, I think is something that that happens often with with um, with black women, um, where our an identity or us as a person is often fractured, um, com compartmentalized by others, and therefore um, misunderstood. Um, and within the phenomena of like celebrity, celebritydom, and like um, the sort of avatar and image and brand creation of ourselves on social media, that world gets amplified. So I'm not just finding like the best images of um, these celebrities or dancers or influencers, but also that, you know, when you're finding, if you're Googling somebody's, um, somebody's name and then you see them on their different platforms, I think there's actually like a meme that tries to, <laughs> There's a meme that tries to like uh, understand that where it's like, this is me on LinkedIn. This is me on Instagram. This is me on Facebook. And then this, and they're all like different sort of, <laughs> you know, like this is you being professional and this is you being, you know, trash. And this is you, you know, being um, provocative, you know, just to say that that's almost like a very blunt way of understanding how the separations of the different selves is emphasized on social media and that that has become a kind of standard place of misunderstanding people, um, no matter if you don't fully understand like black femininity. So we're getting into, um, I know time is creeping up, but um, we're getting into um, Providence College galleries an exhibition I did called uh, Dirty Power at, uh, in, in fall 2018 and, um, I mean, to fall 2019 or was it 18? You know, it's one of those days for me, but um, in Dirty Power, um, you also see the return of that smaller installation, but that I, I make a decision to actually blow up that LCD mount um, scenario once again. So um, I do a, an entire exhibition, you know, pulling from um, also pulling from images of women in the porn industry, um, but also thinking about what would happen if I were to build a sort of custom gigantic mount to, um, to fit a gigantic painting on, onto what would happen when a painting now becomes kind of, um, you know, with a, a sort of infinite potential for display because as they are on functional mounts, they have uh, the ability to be um, tilted upwards or downwards, come in and out from the wall, from all the way flat against the wall to extend out six feet, and also be able to actually swivel around 180 degrees. Um, of course, they're not mechanical and they don't actually move, but um, that these two paintings in the back are on these custom mounts that. Um, that allow for a sort of infinite potential display of these paintings. Um, the painting can be removed from its mount and another painting can go on it, but that it becomes a, a kind of display strategy that turns the painting into uh, uh, potentially a, a something architectural or something that causes you to, um, causes you to enter this tunnel between these two women. Um, and, you know, with a painting that's about 50 by 100 inches wide, you know, it, it, it sort of um, makes you kind of feel suddenly conscious of your body in space. And therefore, as there's a certain flexibility of display with these paintings on these mounts, um, that that flexibility is a sort of demand of society also on these these women and us, you know, these and us. Um, There's also interestingly in this show, the I call it the failed mount because this was supposed to be this custom mount that we had made um, for a, a very small painting that ends up just being that Aurora pattern, which is almost like an abstract pattern that just continues on. And it makes, you know, it makes the environment and the figure relationship almost flattened to the point where you don't always see I'll go back here. Um, you don't always see, um, you know, this one's probably much more graphic, but um, you don't always see sort of the difference between where they begin and where they end as a result of this pattern. But um, this mount was a failed mount. This thing is sort of strapped to the wall and um, you just see that 
it's just dangling down from that point. And I was just trying to play out this, uh, this sort of relationship between these two where it's almost like a continuation of this painting, but one is, is like a sad, <laughs> one is like a sad little version um, in this sitting next to this very powerful, um, you know, like a, a sort of structural mount. Um, to also just like a, a different a different way of trying to express my my thoughts about um, you know being in my own body. So um, I'm gonna try to move a little faster now because of time. You're doing great with time, by the way. Oh, thank you. I'm just I'm just conscious, you know. I just know that I got like multiple other exhibitions to go through, and here I am stuck back in 2000. 19 or something. Um, okay, so moving along to um, my exhibition called The Red Ripper at uh, Luis de Jesus in Los Angeles. And um, this exhibition, um, now I remember, this was beginning 2019. So Providence was late 2018. And this um, exhibition is um, playing with all those same themes because it comes out around roughly within months of the Providence College exhibition. And therefore I'm still talking about, you know, still pulling images from influencers pages from um, also from, you know, uh, sometimes print magazines, which is very rare print magazines that have been scanned onto the internet. So still viewing them through the screen, but um, you know, uh, like this image here, which this painting is, um, you know, attempting to, to kind of like, again, all, all my paintings are me just trying to reconcile how I feel in my own body um, and using these women almost as avatars at, at times um, for what I feel like is my own body type and my own, um, my own need to archive, which is something that's very current, but potentially fleeting and can be easily discarded because of um, who, it's representing, um, meaning just like, just because we are in the era of, um, you know, a lot of black female rappers are trending and they're very popular. Um, we're actually in this very like accelerated cycle where um, in fashion and music and, and art and everything where things rise <laughs> quickly and they fall quickly. So my, Art kind of is an attempt to archive this thing. You know, I, I, painters have tried to do this for a long time, you know, with pop art moving and blah, blah, blah. Not saying that I'm interested necessarily fully in pop art, but um, that's, that's something that's been done. Um, so this image, for example, is like pulling from a print magazine uh, of uh, a woman who's, you know, trying to be the sexy secretary archetype and, you know, um, for me as somebody who's like a professor and feel like I have to always constantly uh, reconcile like, um, you know, a sort of different perspectives on my identity that this becomes like this potent site for me trying to play out um, what I imagine to be everybody's sort of ideas of me. Um, there's also this um, installation that kind of is paired with it, which is a, um, a office chair with an, an LCD mount with a small, you know, little Aurora painting on it. Um, you're not allowed to sit in the chair in this exhibition because it was just too dangerous um, with the way the mount was sitting on there. But um, I'm just sort of implying that like, um, not implying, but that experience of kind of having this painting that can be moved um, that, um, you can have a painting that can turn and orient itself towards you or potentially look at you. So I'll talk about that a little more, but um, that's kind of the basic premise of this little guy there. Um, and also just the, this painting, which um, is one of my, my, my favorite paintings is um, also just kind of like trying to sub subvert the idea of this sort of iconic you know, that, that, that painting of like the powerful figure in your office, um, especially if you're in a university or something and you, you go into su such and such as office where they have the old portraits of 
you know, former presidents um, of the school or figures and, you know, just trying to think of what would that mean to have like a kind of a version of that painting that empowered, that was empowering for a different type of person who, you know, who looks like me. So I'm actually just gonna like be quiet for a moment, mostly because my voice needs a moment of rest. Um, so, I mean, obviously I haven't quite, I'm not gonna be able to touch on everything, but um, there are these moments where you'll notice like uh, the little marks, the little gestures, almost as if she's like dissipating into drawing or um, stuff like that. Some aspects that feel kind of naturalistic and some that feel like there's a drawing on top of her. I mean, the women that I'm painting are also like heavily tattooed and I select them to be so because of the confusion that happens when I take their image and put them into Photoshop. And, you know, that's a further point of confusion, but them as tattooed women, and I'm just, you know, going back to the conversation of like, what is respectable um, or what is part of that culture of these, these women who are um, looked down upon because of the worlds they come from being a tattooed woman is also, um, you know, one of those things. So how do I represent sort of like these different um, marks on the body from tattooing and, and turn them into something that, that, that is, is, is as confusing, not confusing, but is, is the same thing I'm trying to do with the Aurora pattern, which is just kind of fade the figure back into the space, make the environment seem as, as much a, a, a figure as the figure literally is um, to, cam to camouflage the figure, the, the drawing kind of does that as well. So I'm just speeding up only because I have, uh, wanna get to my current exhibition. but I'll, I'll stop and go through these. So, I mean, things that I'm also interested in representing that I feel like are rarely represented in painting, like what, you know, lacy underwear, um, you know, body suits and, you know, heavily, you know, things that are kind of like lingerie that has a lot of different straps and things that are definitely of our current culture, but to, to try to, to have women who are adorned with those things that are also decorated with these tattoos and in these fields. Um, I'm, I'm definitely setting up these circumstances to be like, they are meant to be hard to, to read and hard to see. And this is um, a, a Armory Art Fair booth in 2019 where um, I did a full booth on just the city girls, the, the rap duo from Miami. So this is a good example of kind of like the, the patterning of the, the outfit sort of further confusing against the Aurora. So I think, uh, you know, one thing is that my paintings do photograph much more sharply than they are painted. I tend to paint very quickly. Um, and that means that I can make, and this is no point necessarily meant to be impressive, just other than I really do not have patience for, <laughs> for paintings that take longer than a month. But, um, you know, it, it takes me maybe a week to mine and alter the image and photo editing. And then it takes me you know, usually at most two weeks to complete a painting of most sizes. And therefore the surfaces, unfortunately these paintings are a lot more messy than they appear. But I am interested in how obviously the digital camera is a, uh, a medium that we have to contend with, you know, as painters that the camera has a different sort of eye. It, can see more than we can see, but it can't see everything that we can see. And because of what it does, it confuses some things as well. So how can I try to understand that and cal you know, calculate that um, in my work is 
is still the biggest question. How can I confuse a camera? Um, one way I confuse it is that these images um, can sometimes feel almost a, with a certain photorealism, you know, not photorealism, but uh, at least approaching realism. And you'll stand there in front of the painting in person and not even be able to see the moiré pattern. These dark and light bands sometimes do not register as clearly as they do in, in, in the digital camera image, which just sort of means that the painting lives two lives and the painting always demands an in-person viewing. Um, and that's important to me, but also that now because I am honing in on, how can I confuse the camera? How can I make this moiré system um, confuse it? Um, is, uh, means that the moiré is now a, and a built-in security system kind of for the painting that you, um, and all the ways that I alter the original image, that also becomes a kind of like, you can't ever see this. <laughs> you can't see this painting in the way that you truly want to because the moiré pattern um, will um, kind of uh, make it assert itself much more in a digital camera image than it does in person where you just kind of can stand in front of the painting and it might start fading into a kind of abstraction or you're not even really being able to see it in person until you're standing at least 10 feet away, which is not always possible to do depending on like the architecture of the gallery. So, um, so now we're here kind of uh, in the current times, um, which is my most recent solo exhib exhibition, which was this past fall at the Whole Gallery in New York. Um, and the show is called uh, Crichoa's Indignation. And the show title is just, I, I, <laughs> I'm not gonna really talk too much about my titles just because I wanna get into the work, but uh, um, it was essentially just a phrase that comes from a, a uh, Kanye West tweet from the summer uh, of 2020, where he was essentially arguing with Kim Kardashian, um, you know, saying that their kids will never model for Playboy or something. And, you know, obviously that was like a point of a break in their relationship, but um, this show uses that quote, um, which is uh, actually in his rant. And he, you know, he's bipolar, he's, we don't really quite know what's going on, um, that he accidentally, he's trying to say righteous indignation in the, in, um, and post it to, you know, he's trying to say he's righteously, he's righteously mad, but in his fury and his anger, he autocorrect doesn't catch this um, misspelling of um, righteous. And then it just is this word Kucho is, which is not a word. It's just, but you see that like in the, the photo that he posts that he, he like missed, he missed the mark. Um, and autocorrect didn't didn't capture it. So this is interesting for me because I'm interested in all those points of confusion between us, this interface, what's inside it. Um, this is my, again, I'm building back up. Like, I feel like I, through this whole lecture, like from the beginning, from the Cardi B painting, which is like the beginning of this body of work, I've been building back up to painting installation much more strongly. So I feel like I'm kind of full force into it um, nowadays um, and thinking about um, thinking about paintings now and them as a source of information and a source of power. I use the word power a lot in this lecture. Um, and a lot of my titles kind of refer to nuclear energy sources and things like that, just as a kind of like tidbit. But this is now kind of getting more actively into, you know, dirty power, like as a title is actually like a, a nuclear energy term about a sort of like um, a pulling from power from like a bad source, thread ripper, which was the LA exhibition is a, uh, a, a term of, a, you know, one of the most powerful computer processors currently on the market. And this exhibition now tries, attempts to position painting as a, um, almost as if I were to seriously reduce the content of this exhibition, it would be thinking about the painting as a graphic card, um, essentially, like 
that um, a painting is actually physically resembling a graphic card and it's, uh, you know, I'm talking about repositioning a painting as a window into a screen. Now I'm thinking about sort of um, the computer tower itself and what's in it and design something like the sculpture to hold this painting, specifically thinking of a certain graphic card. You know, I'm personally very interested in um, like um, not just mining images on the internet, but you know, I'm somebody very active on it and I, I'm not really a gamer per se, but I'm very interested in the culture surrounding gaming. Um, thinking about the need of powerful computers as a, to, to be a gamer, also the sort of like culture around it within this exhibition. There's a lot of paintings that actually have like YouTube Let's Players embedded in it with these little picture in picture moments. And um, so now the, there's like a return of a male figure within these paintings, but you know, a kind of communication that is like what's going on right now on the Zoom platform where I'm looking at my own painting, but my own face in these little boxes is interrupting my ability to see my own painting fully. Though I am looking at the painting, I'm also looking at myself or you at the same time or would be. Um, so that this is almost kind of me attempting to kind of speak to the sort of current experience of viewing images, not that we're in the screen, but we're in a screen where windows are within windows all the time. Let's players on YouTube use the picture in picture because they have to show themselves reacting to the game that they're currently playing. Um, but they are existing on the same plane as the thing that they're playing. So I use them to as a kind of attempt to animate the paintings as a kind of game to play, but also um, that they come from two different worlds. The gamer is not actually directly re reacting to these women and femmes of the cabaret, but um, by flattening them onto the same plane, that kind of turns them into what I have called like the critic, the critic in painting. And there's a particular tension there because of the them being male mostly and, um, you know, what would happen if you're talking about the same, you're talking about the painting on an online format like this, your little Zoom square, um, that the painting almost has a built-in sort of criticism mechanism, which is this, the dude, the dude in painting. So there's these, uh, yeah, two, um, there's these uh, little codes on each of these paintings and it's complicated. <laughs> Can I just leave it at it's complicated? No, I can't. But um, I will say that uh, I got into doing these codes on the painting um, because it's um, thinking about, um, I know for some of you, you're like, oh my God, this is some technical information involved here. Yes, I'm kind of, I'm realizing now I'm kind of like a tech nerd at the same time I'm a painting nerd. But, um, you know, thinking about protocols of, of uh, the system that we're looking at this laptop um, and how something like a JPEG can be reduced down to this just information, a series of numbers and series of letters. And um, so therefore with these codes, I had tried to make an attempt to kind of flatten, uh, I'm talking about a lot of flattening of things, but you know, thinking about how an image is an image that you see, but it's because your computer is re reading this code version of it um, in order to generate the JPEG or the PNG as um, the, 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 the true image. So it's like a different way of representing the same type of information. Um, and these codes within this exhibition um, also play a game. Uh, I realize I use that phrase for a reason. It, I was building up to this the whole time. <laughs> at the end of the lecture where um, there was an actual game kind of to this where we actually had the, um, let me see if I can find a better image. We had this in the back of the gallery, um, this big sculpture that had these slots in it so that you can, um, here we go, so that you could display the paintings almost like a museum storage system but this was also equally inspired by the graphic design cards slotted into the CPU tower. Um, 
I call it a kind of render farm because if you needed this many graphic cards lined up like this, you were attempting to render a very powerful image, almost like you're creating like a sci-fi movie or something, an action movie that needs a lot of graphic power behind it. So I just need a few more minutes, but um, yeah, um, essentially that um, there are paintings in here that you could pull out, like you can kind of see. Um, and actually um, just an exhibition I didn't have time to show y'all was just that because of COVID, I had an exhibition that was, had to be an online viewing room because uh, we couldn't actually do the show in LA. And um, this was earlier that year, last year. So by the time we get to the fall of last year, with some time, I wanted to make sure those paintings were shown in person, but they were sold off to collectors. And therefore I wanted them still to be part of this exhibition because they are of the same concept and of the same body of work technically. We had them all printed out, um, reinverted, or I would say re-solarized so they're not their true color, printed out. And so you, you don't actually, these are actually like, this is not a real painting. This is a printout of a painting that nobody will ever see because it was went directly from studio to collector. So um, it, um, in that thinking of the render farm, thinking of the render farm where a, a painting needs to load, load in. <laughs> so like, it's almost like they're being stored in the system where we're like trying to summon the real painting somehow um, by having them stored this way. And that there's one at the front that actually had a functioning code lock, a keypad lock to it. Um, that was a painting that, um, a painting that was only meant to be seen by a select group of people that I gave the, the keypad code to on my close friends list on Instagram. And um, the people that I'm closest to that know everything about me because I blab on social media and they know I post my, my I mean, I post my in progress paintings to everybody, but they see you know all different layers of aspects of me on social media. So for my close friends only, they're allowed to see this one painting, which is revealed to kind of be an underpainting so that the, the system actually holds no real paintings. So as people are, and this is what happened during the exhibition, people are fighting to find the code, find the code, find the code. Only like 20 people in the United States have the code. Um, it could be figured out because actually one of the paintings in exhibition, I won't go back to it. One of the paintings in the exhibition actually had the real code painted on it. Um, and so just thinking about gaming uh, strategies, especially of like, you know, these sort of like um, horror games that sometimes have like the, the, cue, the, the clue to find the code somewhere in room that you have to search for. So um, I know I'm a little out of time, but I'm probably going to end there and let y'all ask questions and I'll help me fill in some of the things I didn't cover. But um, this is my, my last or my most current exhibition. So um, I'll leave, um, I guess I, I can leave the image up, but if y'all got questions, I'm more than happy to start answering a few. I know that that was a lot of information and I almost feel like I could, I could genuinely talk another hour about things that I didn't <laughs> talk on, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. That was, that was really great. I love hearing um, the multi-layered, just everything that goes into the image. It's so complex visually and conceptually. And I think it's great to hear um, for me and also for our students. And so we, I've gotten so many questions um, like on myself and I'm going to do my best to kind of uh, read them and represent them as they are intended. The first one comes from an art historian at University of Houston, Sandra Zalman. Um, wrote in to ask, she said, I'm curious about your experimental use of color with regard to fauvism, especially Matisse's blue nude, which is thought to depict a black woman. Also the painting of black China reminds me of Matisse's green stripe painting. Matisse is doing the black female body as the other and your work is from an insider and more empowered perspective. Is this formal overlap, if we can characterize it as that, a knowing response to patriarchal depictions of the female form in the history of art. <laughs> so we're starting with oh. a 
complicated. <laughs> don't feel like just I, you know, I I'm asking it because I I thought it was an interesting sort of link um to to other work, but any aspect of that that you want to speak to would be great. Yeah, um, I mean, definitely. Uh, I don't actively. I mean. I have like studied the Fovis and things like that. And I, I think I'm coming at it from a different perspective, particularly as Matisse was using his, you know, those colors. Um, I'm not necessarily directly trying to, you know, speaking of inversion and stuff like maybe like co-opt that strategy um, based off of Matisse, um, but also, well, I would say that for me, it, it ends up being a kind of um, way when I do the solarization of the skin and you see like, you know, in this image where like most of the brown skin has kind of converted into this, the blue, um, where for me, it's almost like a, um, I don't feel necessarily compelled to represent the skin as it need, as it is accurately, one, in order to emphasize that it's always a point where people begin to misinterpret you know, dark skinned folks, but that because I um, am a black woman, I'm representing other black and brown women um, of the same or similar skin tone that um, when I do this inversion, um, it's almost like um, one, a point that is sympathetic, which is, is just kind of like, okay, well, we, um, we are the same. So I almost, um, um, it, 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 it turns almost, if I were to even invert to like a lighter skin tone, it would be a slightly different color, but like you wouldn't quite be able to register necessarily the difference between like a light skin person and a dark skin person in the solarization. Um, and therefore that's kind of like a kind of an a, a understanding between us, me and the figures that I'm representing. And then it's also to kind of purposefully alienate them. Um, and that is a different sentiment, which is just kind of, I'm, I'm turning them more alien than they are um, to kind of just communicate that that is what happens when you're of this, this skin tone. So instead of like, I used to do this distortion of them, um, which you saw in one painting where they kind of had googly, one had like googly eyes and like big lips and stuff that's similar to kind of like my older work that I didn't show here, but this ends up being like a good halfway point for me to express just the ways that like um, to be black is to kind of be othered or to be alien, um, but to do it in a way where it's also kind of like, I see you and I understand and we are the same um, and we relate in this way. Um, and it, it does flatten, it does flatten folks onto the same plane. Like you can see there's like the white YouTuber at the bottom who is it solarized, but there's, his skin tone is actually registering exactly the same as everybody else's. So um, it's not like some like we, we are the world <laughs> uh, thing, but it, it, it is a little bit of like the, the interface also does this sort of flattening. It comes in and does this flattening too that um, I'm, I'm trying to throw into the soup of all these things. Um, thank you for that. So the next question I'm kind of combining a few, there's, there's so many questions I'm sort of combining a few different ones because they all relate to, to sort of what you were just talking about, but how involved are the women and the men in the process of the painting? Do you, can you discuss a little bit about whether or not you, you get consent from the models or they all found imagery and has anyone ever had a reaction um, to this, to being in your painting. And then the second part of that um, is, can you speak a little bit about the voyeuristic aspect of these works? Sure. Um, I mean, for the most part, the, the images are mined um, from social media. I say mining as a kind of like <laughs> part of the process, but um, they are found on social media. They're also sometimes paparazzi images. They're sometimes like images from other things going on in the photo shoot and not necessarily the direct, there also uh, have been stills of music video sh uh, shoots, but I've never had, um, well, the, the one, there's one model that I've painted multiple times, uh, particularly in the, 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 
the Thread Ripper exhibition, which was the one with the, the, se the sexy secretary one, um, where I had I have painted this one model almost like you know 15 times, um, and this was really early on that I kind of honed in on on her, um, and she was like very. Um, interesting for me because she you know like black china or something is like you know not a celebrity but just kind of locally known you know within like um being a bartender at cabarets and stuff in brooklyn but um i had reached out to her because i was just like um i wanted her to know that i was gonna paint her and i think she thought that i was a fan <laughs> she thought i was a fan she was like oh you know flattered and you know i i was hoping to kind of like build it up to a greater thing um but then I realized that like um that that was likely always going to be the case um I did want to say that like I have I'm painting so many different types of women coming from so many different levels of power and so like there was a, a point where I had to stop painting like the Nikki and Cardi B's because I felt like they were overrepresented and then sometimes I'm painting like influencers who have small followings or you know, exotic dancers and porn actresses that are lesser known. And so, of course, I have to kind of not necessarily treat all images equally, but, um, and even within one person, like let's say if I choose an influencer as a small following, they have many different types of images. Like they'll have like the photographer image, which is like, you know, um, watermarked. And I, I did actually want to talk about, this leads me into another conversation, which is like why there's a gigantic code over it all, which is a little bit kind of like a stand-in for like a watermark type thing um, and thinking about potential for copyright um, and ownership um, and ownership of images on That's this sort of way. Like, like that one painting that had the numbers along the bottom and thinking about when you hold your phone up against the barcode and you take a picture and it like pulls up, up information. And so I was curious if that was on your mind when you were, um, painting that image. Yeah, yeah, it's like a kind of like authentication. Right. You know, there's two different types of authentication. It's like the watermark and also the CAPTCHA, which is like a security code you type in in order to enter a website. So um, thinking about the power relationships of like where these images are found. I've never, again, like only besides this model and that interaction, I've, I've never personally communicated with any of the other influencers and I actively choose not to do so because, um, I think the way that I'm playing with these images, it requires a, a voyeuristic distance. And um, because I'm speaking of all these things in between us, if I were to um, you know, reach out and have a relationship with them beyond that, then I think that the work would, would be different and would change. So, I mean, my voyeuristic interest in it is that, you know, I'm choosing women who have like a kind of avatarish relationship to me and how I feel about my body that I do not know personally, who are like purposely on different stratospheres, stratospheres of the power, you know, the, the rappers versus the, the bartenders of the, the clubs. But, um, and I, I look at them um, sympathetically and from like points of desire and points of kind of like, I need to, I need to, project like I need to project onto you this thing because I I don't want to represent myself uh necessarily okay um is it okay if I move us there's so many questions that I just want to be able to get to a few more of them if that's okay um so I noticed your work on the wall unstretched you know while it was in progress and you were painting so can you talk a little bit about how um your process goes and do you think about the installation before you begin the painting or is that come along after the painting's finished can you tell us a little bit about how a painting gets made what your process is yeah um i was hoping to try to scroll all the way back up without having to do it by going one by one but um i'll re-enter screen share um yeah so i it installation stuff kind of. Let me just get into this before I start talking. Um, I think the installations like uh, happen simultaneously as the paintings, but uh, depends. I think um, because I think the installations, especially now, are 
almost meant to be a kind of support for the painting, like they like the mount, which can kind of have any painting on it, or the 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 render farm that can have any painting within it. Um, I I have always wanted to kind of do that type of system, like security system, render farm thing for a while. So it doesn't necessarily demand a very specific type of painting to be in it other than I had to make a decision kind of very tight, <laughs> tight and close to the deadline to not actually put a real painting into that system. But um, they happen at the same time. Um, as far as like the painting process, um, I just paint on stretch because I, sometimes I make paintings very quickly and I, I want to have a flexibility of changing size. So if I had ordered a bunch of standard structures, I'd end up being kind of unhappy sometimes because I do want to make, it frustrates everybody, but I, <laughs> every painting is like slightly differently sized at times. And I just, I like letting the, the image size kind of dictate the, the painting size, which is another new interest of mine is like just thinking about these, the information within a file much more uh, actively, but um, I make underpaintings. So you can kind of see how I map out the, this is a painting that's halfway done. So this mm -hmm. middle part is like done and I've yet to finish. This is all underpainting. So I, I have like, um, this one's done so I can't show. Um, this underpainting is like, essentially has the entire painting kind of mapped out in a way. Um, so um, with a very reduced color, it's usually just like, this is the light version of the drawing. This is the light version of the background. This is a darker version of that color and a darker version of the background. Um, so I'm mapping out the moiré pattern system. It looks much more sharp, obviously, in the underpainting than it ends up looking when the painting is painted in. Like this is just like an unaltered iPhone image. But um, yeah, so it's like a, um, a two-part process. I, I make the underpainting and I let it dry. Um, and things do deviate um, a little bit sometimes, but I'm true, I tend to be true to the image that I'm generating in photo editing. So um, a lot of, I do a lot of work in photo editing um, and um, now the paintings are a little bit more complex because I'm, I'm not only doing the dark and light, which means I have two different palettes. You know, I have the dark palette and I have the light palette. But now you can kind of see in this first painting that I have a, um, a sat an issue with saturation where I'm like desaturating the image down to black and gray. So there's not like six palettes that I'm trying to map out. And I don't do this mapping of the desaturation. This is, I'm just speaking of something that's now just happening and has not existed in previous paintings. That mapping does not exist in the underpainting. So it ends up being kind of like a little haphazard. And obviously it's the first painting that I'm doing of this system, but um, that's to say, again, I think the, the, the digital image kind of makes it all look a lot sharper than it is. They, they're very like, sometimes they're like very thickly painted and you can see the underpainting a little underneath and there's these thick moments. So in real life, what you're saying is it's a much more physical kind of like expressive experience. And that's kind of like an interesting tension against the kind of digital. And so that gets definitely. lost in the translation of the, of the images. Definitely. Yeah, uh, I think definitely. It's important to keep in mind, um, you know, that, that we, like a digital image of a painting is not a painting. Um, so I would love to see them in person to see that kind of physicality. Um, which is also interesting because they're very definitively paintings. Like when you, the, the structure where you pull out the reproductions, that's like a dramatically different experience than standing in front of one of them. Um, can you talk a little bit about dark study and specifically the idea of wrong education and third space? Oh, that would be a whole other lecture, I'm, I'm afraid. So uh, <laughs> I honestly just, with well, the energy levels, I'm happy to direct you to the Okay, fair <laughs> enough. It, that's, a, that's a whole other <laughs> Will you give us just like, I mean, to the extent that it's possible, will you tell the students just a little bit about dark study? Yeah, um, sure. It's, um, 
it's a, a kind of new program that I started um, at the start of the pandemic, and now it's actually uh, in the in our sort of first um, sessions of courses. And um, I wanted to respond to some of my frustrations um, of the of higher ed and art um, in like a very material of a way that I could think of um, with folks that felt the same way, um, and just being able to to provide an alternative at a time where, you know, I've, I've been teaching this entire time um, at VCU. Mm -hmm. So dark study was never meant to, well, dark study actually started with the potential for me to not be able to work at VCU anymore because of how folks are getting laid off everywhere. But, um, and so potentially then to be a, a life raft for, for, for me and others that I knew um, mm -hmm. struggling with the same, but, uh, it, that's why it started, but um, you know, I, I'm I'm somebody obviously very interested in like the internet, the experience of the internet, and I felt that it's possible to do this this sort of education online. Um, and for me, it was an opportunity to also work with folks um, who I would never really be able to consider colleagues at a, a university because you have to actually like fly in and move people around to build a faculty. So uh, with dark study, everybody lives in a different city. Um, all the, what I would call a faculty, um, live in different cities, advisors, all, some of us live in different countries. Um, and uh, we're concentrating on building a virtual school um, definitively. So that is international and that's uh, different from, different from standard art education because it's, um, it, it's hard to be international because you physically have to move people in right. if you demand them to have studios. It's free. It's free because it's partially voluntary labor and also partially crowdfunded uh, money. Um, and that might not always be the case, but we wanted to have a free school that could potentially like um, be functional. That is not a emergency solution to the problems of the pandemic in higher ed, but just to actually like attempt to build a different type of school. So, you know, the words like contra institution or para institution, we throw around because we, we don't want to make dark city into some powerful <laughs> new program like Whitney ISP or whatever, a residency program, or even like eventually become some like big MFA program. We're not seeking any sort of accreditation, but that we do want to provide like an equally uh, potent like quality of uh, secondary, post-secondary education to students for free and do it almost like with the ability to move in between institutions. So I'm at VCU still, the other faculty, you know, my co-director Nicole also still teaches at a home institution and we might have to move dark study to be paired up with another institution in order to survive. We might need to disconnect it and, you know, um, you know, actually feed off of and siphon resources from some of these uh, institutions and just how I move like as a, as an artist and um, with connections that I have. So that's a really like tr truncated way to say all that, but I think, yeah, oh. it's a, uh, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to describe it. In short words. Yeah, but it, I think it's really important um, for our students to hear a little bit about it. And of course they can go Google it and find out more information, but coming, um, you know, it, it's great to hear it straight from you. So I appreciate that that um, explanation. I was going to end with one last question, if that's okay. Can you just tell us about a regular day for you? Like what? Like how much time are you in the studio? What What's that like? Like walk us through just your average. <laughs> oh wow, that's actually such a simple but powerful question. Because um, I mean, I I don't know if I have a typical day, but at least to reveal some things about myself is that I am an extreme morning person um, nowadays. I don't know why I think, um, uh, I think it start partially started that, um, it's a thing more recently that I, I started learning how to ride a motorcycle. So I wake up really early to learn how to ride. <laughs> so I don't have to ride in, in public, you know, busy streets at like four or 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, and then I just sort of do emails and stuff because I'm teaching 
a lot, but um, if it's just a studio day, I'm in there pretty early, like eight or nine. And I, I, like I mentioned before, I'm a very impatient painter <laughs> and I feel like I spend like four or five hours in the studio before I'm about ready to go, ready to go home. And, you know, I'm, I'm like jacked up on energy drinks for most of the day. And then I, um, I crash and I go home and usually, uh, like, um, I spend my evenings kind of just dealing with like teaching type stuff or just relaxing and watching. Um, well now I'm watching like bad netflix shows but um you know it's uh, a <laughs> oh, what's a bad netflix show i have to... oh i'm currently watching bridgerton which is like a shonda shonda rhymes show it's kind of terrible but um yeah it's that and also like watching like youtube i do watch like youtube let's players uh play games too which is interesting because it's not really like um Stam freight train. It's like um, I, I watch. I don't play games, but I like watching other folks play games as almost like a voyeurist. So like, like it's very voyeuristic for me to like be understanding somebody else's interpretation of playing a game as opposed to me like directly interacting with that game. Um, so that's kind of like how I spend my evenings. And each day for me is a little different, especially when I start teaching this semester. But yeah, I'm I'm. I'm impatient in the studio. I'm just like, I love painting, but I'm just kind of like, all right, I got, <laughs> I got four hours to get this in because if I go beyond that time and obviously now I'm doing very like meticulous painting mm -hmm. um, that is just like very, you know, it has my brain sort of like firing on a lot of different cylinders in order to make sure everything's organized the way it should be on the surface. So. It's exhausting, actually. I, I don't spend, I'm not one of those, like, I spend 12 hours in the studio a day. I, I would go crazy, actually. You know, it's interesting because I was just listening to a podcast, um, Sound and Vision, and, and the most recent person on there was Ellen Altfest, who makes these very complex, like hyper-realistic paintings and thinking that are all from observation um, and thinking about the, her paintings in relationship to the kind of complexity. I mean, there is such detailed complexity in what you're painting. It does seem like so your brain is probably exhausted, with, you know, trying to man manage the multiple layers of the thinking that goes into making that image I would imagine at the end of four or five hours of that you're totally exhausted so it's interesting to hear yeah yeah so I mean when everybody works kind of a little differently um and I it works it works for me I'm I'm very like um I try to be efficient when I make moves on any front but um I, I'm definitely not kind of like contemplative. I'm not contemplative in the studio. Um, I'm not really there like with a couch. I don't have a couch in there. You know, you can, you can tell. No, but you no, get, I, you like make it, you're, you're working when you're in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, um, you can kind of tell that it's just like, it's very like bare bones. Like there, there's no, there's no, if I'm not really painting um, or like eating lunch, then I, I'm, I'm ready to go home. And I usually allow myself to do that when I know that it's a bad day in the studio. Um, I do try to stick it out when I absolutely have to, if I have dead, deadlines and stuff coming up, but then it ends up being weaker and um, it, it, it does happen. But um, yeah, that's just how I work. Thank you so much, Caitlin. That was so great. Um, I We appreciate you spending the day with us. And I know our students are really looking forward to their meetings with you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and um, looking forward to potentially seeing some of you all uh, in my next visits, which hopefully uh, I feel like I'm probably overlapping with that time now, but uh, take a few minutes and do what you need to. And the students will be there in the waiting room when you're ready. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. We're signing off. Thank you.